Welcome back to Demystify Sci. I'm Shiloh. I'm Anastasia. And on the show today, we have a recurring guest back again, ourselves. And today, we are following up on our last solo conversation about David Graeber's work, The Utopia of Rules, by examining the utopian vision as it applies not just to historic utopias, but also towards the project of science itself. We also have a dead guy with us to help us along on this journey. That is William James, James who yeah. was a psychologist and ultimately a philosopher. He had an appointment at Harvard, but he gave this lecture series at the University of Edinburgh, which is in Scotland, obviously, in 1901 and 1902. And the lecture series is a little difficult to get into. It has a slow ramp to it. He spends the early parts, I'd say most of the lecture, honestly, it's over, the, I think, about 10 different lectures. He spends most of it trying to calm everybody down that he's psychoanalyzing religion and that they should be okay with it, and it's not a threat to their religious practices. But towards the back end, he starts to examine really interesting stuff, in particular, mysticism. And so mysticism plays an interesting role as a dialectic opposite to rationalism and science. And that's how we end up examining the utopian project of science and how utopias often need to exist in the context of some external evil that they are reacting against, just like science believes that it needs to exist in opposition to mysticism. Of course, if you've been following this show for any length of time, we have been very concerned that mysticism is actually slipping in at the base of science. And that doesn't mean that we hate mysticism. In fact, what's really cool about William James's approach to mysticism is that he believes it's a part of our ordinary lives, that every day we just have mystical, well, not every day, but quite often in our lives, everyone will have some sort of mystical experience. And so it's not that we're trying to eradicate mysticism from the world, but we're concerned about how it fits into science, and we want to take the time to sit down and discuss that in detail. I think what we're trying to accomplish by casting this in the light of utopias is that we've had a lot of conversations recently about the feasibility of utopias, the utility of utopias. And I've kind of come to the realization that the, the goal of a utopia is not to actually achieve the stated aims of the project, though that would be really nice. It's more about creating a frame in which we actually actively think about evil and wrestle with it and recognize when it arises within ourselves and within the societies that we're trying to build. And what happens in the super hyper-rationalist project of science, as set against the external force of mysticism, is that if we're blinded to the places where mysticism arises at the heart of science, like quantum physics, like evolutionary biology, we're not really able to wrestle with the questions that we hope to answer. And so the project fails because it becomes corrupted from the inside out without anybody even realizing it. And that's a crazy thing. And, and what's worse is that if we believe science is the only system of analysis capable of giving explanation for questions about our physical existence, about our mental existence, then we run the risk of ignoring the people who actually can say things about that and the modalities of expressing ideas about the mystical realm because we expect science to be able to do it when science has no chance of being able to do it, at least in my opinion. And so we wrestle with all of these things. We wrestle with what is the point of taking on a rationalist project like science if it will always and forever be co-opted by these massive mystical currents that run through each and every single one of us? What is the point of engaging in utopian projects if we recognize that utopias are also inherently fallible and can never succeed? It's, it's a conversation about why the Aiming for a platonic form is useful and what we must wrestle with in that journey in order to make it something that is effective for the world. Which is funny because we didn't talk about this in the conversation that we just recorded, but William James, after this lecture series, ultimately goes on to develop his philosophy of pragmatism. And it seems to be that that's his takeaway message from this entire lecture series is, well, 
religious experiences are kind of weird and potentially dangerous, but they're cool in so much as they're good for the people that have them. Which is like, it's not that profound of a conclusion, but I think it does tee up a lot of his revelations about how to approach epistemology in his own studies going forward that ultimately terminates in pragmatism. Which is cool. I think that's a great way of looking at any system of thought. It's like, well, what can this do for me, right? We've heard Michael Levin express that on the show before. You know, what's the value of this theory? What does it do? What does it allow me to do? What do I gain from this? And it's a great criticism, too. I mean, we've put, uh, we put the material atomics framework in front of John Kramer, and he's like, well, I don't see what I'd get from that. And I'm like, great, let's talk about what you'd get from it. That's a great conversation just waiting to happen. So, I love William James. It's a difficult lecture series to get through. I, but it's also beautiful. It's it's really is a classical approach to philosophy and thought. He's just kind of. Ta- I mean, it's obvious he's giving a lecture. He's just kind of talking, and so he's going through all of these things of, oh well, these are going to be the arguments that you have against this, and this is how I'm going to address the argument. And so, in some ways, it's a really, it's dry in some places, and I think that we've picked out the pieces that are most relevant to our discussion, but I really loved just watching his brain work. Yeah, I guess if if I was going to recommend that you read this, I would say start at the back and read it backwards. Yeah. <laughs> the best stuff is buried at the end. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoy it. It's uh, I think it's getting us set for this conversation. We're having a, our third discussion with Simon Michaud this Friday, and we're going to explore this Prometheus project. And so I feel like I have a better lens a better toolkit for discussing these ideas so i'm really stoked for that conversation yeah and if you like what we do as always consider coming over to patreon.com and supporting us by giving us a small monthly donation it allows us to continue exploring these topics and thinking deeply about the conversations that we're going to have on the podcast it gives you the ability to join our growing community of sunday chat patrons where we get together once a week and we talk about either people we're going to interview on the podcast or philosophical topics of nature and science or just these open burning questions that people have about how something works. It's a really popular space or it's a really awesome space that we get to participate in every week and you get to participate in as well if you join the Patreon. If you don't like Patreon, you can buy a t-shirt. You can also send us a PayPal donation. We have super thanks enabled on YouTube We're trying our best to make sure that this podcast never has advertisements or sponsors because we really believe that that is the absolute best way to do it. And so if you like what we do, support us and show us that you appreciate it. Uh, If you don't have any cash, that's totally fine. Leave a comment, subscribe, tell your friends about the podcast, and come find us on YouTube. YouTube. We're already on YouTube. Maybe. Uh, You could be on Spotify right now. That's true. We're also on YouTube. Um, leave a rating on any of the podcast platforms uh, and come find us on Facebook, Twitter, Discord, and I think Instagram Instagram as well. Yeah. And so we'd love to see you there. We are always in the comments responding to people's questions and trying to figure out what drives our audience so that we can get closer to what you guys are interested in. Find that overlap. Yeah. Uh, Anything else to say? Enjoy the conversation, guys. We'll see you next time. The scientific revolution starts now. If you have a utopia, the utopia is meant as a permanent structure that runs either alongside capitalism or eventually takes over capitalism. And so it's not quite the same as a company. Like worker ownership is a business version of a utopia, but the utopia as the platonic category is an alternative system that people live within and everything operates under these rules of less suffering, more fairness, fewer strictures, no evil, no bad, right? That's what utopia is. And so... The reason that capitalism works is because capitalism is kind of the system where it's like, okay, well, there's good things and there's bad things and we have markets and the markets are really efficient and we're able to distribute resources according to this. And the capitalism works because everybody assumes that the market will one way or another 
figure it out. And it accepts people as they are, more or less. There's good, there's bad. We'll chart the middle path. Utopia requires a fundamentally different way of people to be, which is it requires people to not be evil and exploitative. And that's why I think that it never works, because even if you get a small group of people together that are like, okay, we're, we're going to be utopians, we're not going to be evil, we're not going to be exploitative, that's so not ingrained in us as a species that it's not a low energy confirmation. And if we take from physics the idea that states are most stable when they're in their lowest possible energy confirmation, utopia is a really high energy state because you're constantly having to fight against these innate human tendencies, which we can broadly categorize them as evil. There's people that want to make you do things against your consent. They want to violate your ability to choose. So two things. I think that in any organization, there's going to be a small percentage of people, I'd say less than 5%, who are the ones that are visionary and making everything happen, that are driving everybody, cranking everybody up, and generally directing the flow of, of energies, let's say, for lack of a better word. There's also in any population something on that same order of percentage of people that are, for lack of a better word, psychopaths, right? Some peg it as high as 5% of any population. Who People who just generally don't care about other people's feelings, their experiences, they're out for their own personal gain at the cost of literally everything else. And so how do you maintain a structure that excludes... Oh, by the way, the overlap of those two is where you get into a real nightmare because oftentimes, not often, but of those psychopaths, some of them are going to overlap with the super effective, high-functioning, charismatic mover types, let's say the leaders, right? And so you're going to end up with a couple of psychopath leaders every now and then. And since 95% of the population isn't going to jump up and start steering the ship, Every single organization is open to this kind of capture or decay. It's it's almost inevitable. And the hope in designing a structure, like the reason I think the United States has survived as long as it has, is because they set up this system of checks and balances where there's not one leadership position that has all the power. That was in some sense this idealistic rebellion against monarchy, even though the monarchy was significantly weakened by that point, and there was councils and parliaments and all of this. So I think that it's a broken system from the beginning when you think that you're going to be able to exclude those people because they emerge naturally in the children of any population. That's yeah, like just... normal people have psychopath children. Exactly. So it's like, okay, so there's a mutation that arises, which means that even if you start with a group of people that are all intensely good and intensely organized around this idea of we're just going to do good things, they at some point will have a child who's a total psychopath. And in a system where everybody thinks that everyone is going to be doing good and is going to care for everybody else and be out for the community and the collective, the minute that you have a single person who's like, well, I don't care about the collective. I can just do what I want. And and I'm really good at it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really good. And by the way, this makes me think of another thing that we should talk about, which is that these communities never exist in a vacuum. And so the problem with psychopaths inside of a community of utopians is that they're very useful idiots to anybody who's threatened by this utopia. Like I've been reading about the violence in the Philippines back during the 60s. Mm. I don't know anything about this. Uh, well, it's just another one of, you know, Chomsky has written about it extensively. It's just another one of those situations where you have the rise of some dictator who in this case is rebelling against the communists in his country, ends up just leading, uh, I believe his name's Suharto. 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 Sorry. Yeah. I guess I do know. I know the name. And he ends up being quite useful to the United States, who's very afraid of the Cold War at the time, very afraid of communism. So they're feeding this guy. They're giving him all the intel and help and support that they can because he's killing communists, right? But the reality of the situation is the people he's killing are farmers and peasants and poor people who, yeah, they like the song of communism in the sense that it elevates the workers up, but they're not really threatening people, right? They're not 
actively uh, forming a new government or anything like that. And he ends up just prosecuting all of his political rivals eventually, and it's just this utter hellscape as a result of it. But the funny thing about it is, again, it's supported from outside. If you just look at the situation in its bubble, it's a lot harder to understand than if you understand that there's this huge superpower outside who's like, yeah, this violence is actually quite useful to us. And so I think that in any community, the real danger of the psychopath rising up is also the fact that they are potentially quite a useful idiot to somebody who's threatened competitively by this utopian project in any shape or form. It's like, Simon, we're going to talk to him on Friday about his Prometheus project. And he's alluded to it on the show before. They're going to go down to South America somewhere in the desert and build a city. And it's going to be this utopian bubble. And it's like, cool, well, what about the country that you're inside of? How are they going to feel once you guys start prospering? You think they're going to want to bite out of that apple? Probably. They're going to have a much bigger army than you. Oh, yeah, you guys don't even have a plan for an army, by the way. Okay, but even if you did, they're going to make friends with, like, who are the type of people that rise to the top of a military leadership? Well, you run into that same cross-section of super capable people and also people who are oriented towards violence. And so that's a nice person to capture if you're wanting to get a little piece of that pie. So even if he pulls off his incredible utopian community, it still exists within the context of the wider nation state that it's a part of. At the very least, even if all of those nations fail, there's still the city-states that surround it that are going to exert their influence. And this has always been the case. Which is why it feels like something that you should aim for, but also aim for with the realization that it can never work. Yeah, Beca- right, right, right. right, because I mean, the, the idea... The idea then becomes, okay, so you look at it and you're like, theoretically, a utopia cannot work because of X, Y, and Z reasons. You have uh, psychopaths that uh, emerge in the population, even if the population is a population of saints. You have the fact that you're embedded in a world that has other actors that are interested in taking you apart and putting somebody to work for them inside of your utopian community and dismantling you. And you have the problem of what happens if the geopolitical system changes in such a way where you're actually really successful and you have resources that somebody else wants and they just come in and they take them and you're done. Okay. Those are all near certain points of failure, but I think that it's still worth doing. Which is kind of a weird thing because, okay, why would you do a futile project? Why would you take on something as silly and absurd as a utopian project if you know that it's going to fail? Well, potentially because it moves you in the right direction. I mean, the United States was a utopian project by the same set of definitions. It's just that the founders authored the... They had a military. It did, but it was pretty ramshackle at first, actually. Sure, but it was born... The utopia, quote-unquote, was born out of military action, which is really interesting. I mean, the guys did a good job of organizing it in such a way that it could withstand 300 years. I mean, it's unclear if it'll survive another 300 without a new edition of the Articles of Confederation, essentially, right? Without tearing it down to the studs and building something that actually matches the modern world. But they did not just assert a utopian ideal and wander blindly into it. They tried to erect all of these different checks and balances, which is the ma- main reason I think that the rest of the world has copied that model to whatever extent they've been able to, because that seems to be the only hope we have of dealing with the fact that, yeah, individuals are going to be tyrants now and then, but the system as a whole has to be able to withstand their assaults. And the idea that not everybody's going to be a tyrant all the time is at the base of this. And if you have a strong enough military that you can enforce your own preferences and your own borders and your own security in such a way that you don't run the risk of somebody coming in and taking you over because they want your coal or natural gas or clean water or whatever else. Right? So it immediately 
it immediately complicates this picture of utopia because it is inherently violent. And I think that a utopia is a place that isn't violent and that doesn't have war and that doesn't have civil wars and doesn't have slavery and doesn't have all of these things where people are subjugated in order to accomplish the goals of a larger system. People are willing participants that don't have to be coerced into action. That's the utopian ideal. And so it's like, there might be some aspects of utopianism in the establishment of something like the United States, but ultimately it was born of violence and built by slavery. And so it's like, it's only, it's like utopia asterisk. Well, that's because the utopia is a very subjective experience, right? But My utopia tr- might look different than yours. Oh, interesting. I would imagine that utopia is like a universal. No, because when the founders forged our system of governance and declared independence from Great Britain, they didn't mean for everybody. Well, I think that that's what makes, that's what disqualifies it from being labeled as a utopian project. I think they would have seen it as utopian, though. It's a great deal for them. Sure, but I think that if we do, you think that it's possible to to have like, like a platonic uh, form of some? Because I mean, you can have a platonic form of something, and then everything else is this ramshackle version of it. But I think in the platonic form of a utopia, you can't have slavery and violence. That's not a utopia, right? Thing. Well, that's the thing is that okay, those are both really different paths. Slavery compelled labor, right? Presumably with no pay, little pay, maybe subsistence pay. A lot of violence. You get into a lot of fine lines. Obviously, Chattel slavery is different than just the modern versions. Like wage slavery. Yeah, it gets really into the weeds because, you know, this is another thing with Simon's model. He has this idea where at the center of the city are going to be the philosopher kings, right? But if you pay attention, what's going on in the rest of the city? People are like sorting trash and... I imagine they'll have through. a lot of automation. I mean, I think that... No, 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 but just let's hold it to his vision of it. He's talking about 10,000 people. I don't know how many precisely were supposed to be the Philosopher Kings, but not that many. Most of the people are picking through trash and doing very difficult manual labor, from what I can tell. That's a really in- interesting article of Confederation because it's written not by the ones who are planning on, man, I really wish I had a good city to go to and pick through trash, right? Sure, but I mean, it, the same criticism can be leveled against the U.S. government, right? Like the founding fathers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this is, right. So like every single utopia is bordered by the material reality, which is that the people that come up with the notion of utopia are always the philosopher kings. And they're always like, well, I'd like to be able to sit around on my plantation and think big thoughts and make sure that I can go to the store and get my butter and my grain and my meat. And so we're going to have to organize this in such a way where we have lots of people around that are providing the goods and taking care of the services so that I can continue to live freely. And when you have these small utopian communities, I think that... um, Oh, I can't remember the name of it. It was a really famous commune where it was uh, the Transcendentalists, the like Emerson, Thoreau era crew. uh, Upstate New York, New England. Yeah, Nathaniel Hawthorne was there. It was like all of these romantic era American intellectuals. And they went to a place in upstate New York where they were going to abandon the cities, return to nature, and this was going to be the place where they were able to think their beautiful thoughts, write their poetry, make their art beautiful. And they really quickly realized that, like, Jesus Christ, farming is really hard work. It takes all of our time. We have no leisure time to be able to do all of the things that we imagined that we could do. And, I mean, it survived, I think, I don't know, a generation maybe, before it just shook itself apart because it was just too hard to maintain. Nobody was able to actually fulfill the artistic promise that they had in mind because that was a small enough group where they were trying to bring all of the functional labor pieces in 
to the system, into this contained place where they were like, well, we're not just going to be philosopher kings, we're also going to be farmer kings, we're also going to be weaver kings, we're also going to be rancher kings. And they very quickly were like, we can't possibly do this. And so that's what I mean about the inevitability. Like you, you aspire towards this platonic form of like, let's make this as egalitarian as possible. But you are stuck with the fact that there's shitty work. Like there's the trash pickers and there's the the chicken butchers and everything else. And we try to outsource it and we try to have parts of society that we give the unpleasant work to. But you can't really build a system without that. Because if you're like, okay, well, the philosopher kings are going to do all the dirty work. Philosopher kings won't stay. Yeah, I think the best thing that Simon could do in that case is make sure that you have a lot of those trash pickers and miners and manual laborers represented amongst the early stages of the planning of this. Because they might have a different picture of the way the city should be laid out. And if you set up a conflict from the beginning in the design of this utopian metropolis then it's just sort of tragic and it's going to fail quicker than otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I think that the vision for the Prometheus Project is a larger scale than any of these minor uh, societies that form. Oh, that kind of bothers me, though, too. Why? Because when in the last podcast when we were talking to Simon, I was like, well, why don't you guys try this with the smallest possible version first, right? And he kind of blew me off and was like, well, I've seen it happen before in mining communities. They set up these tents and they have a tent city and it's fine. So we know that can work. And I'm like, all right, well, like, try that. Try it. Because if you can't do it with 50 people, how in the hell are you going to do it with 500? You know, you see this, with, 10, bi- you see this with businesses all the time. When they go from being a mom pa organization to having a few employees, it's really hard. And then when they go from having a few employees to having 100, it's also really hard. And these are huge breaking points for companies. When you go from having 100 employees to having 1,000, it's really, really hard. Because all of a sudden, you have to find a way to connect with people beyond that Dunbar number. Or, and, and there's smaller scale versions of that number, I believe, as well. It's just two people working on a business. Everybody knows what's going on all the time. When you have a sea, a sea of employees that you're managing, even no matter how big or small it is, you have a whole new set of Intel requirements that aren't immediately available to you. So I'm like, yo, try that out on a small scale. Like They have a Venus Project location right now. They have a small compound. Why not get that going first? I think zoning requirement, like we were talking about, you know, okay, so you build this somewhere in South America and what happens when the government decides that they want a piece? That is a fairly long horizon because you're going to set stuff up, you're going to get things going, the amount of time that it takes you to start producing something useful is, I don't know, decade, five years, whatever before the government starts to pay attention to. But in a place like Venus, Florida, the government's already there. The government wants a hand in permitting, and wants a hand in building codes, in occupancy levels. It's going to happen anywhere you go. No, that's not true. Like, there's places, if you build something in the middle of the desert in South America, that is far enough away from the, the, the hands of power that they might not even have zoning for that place. Like, you can do whatever you want. Zoning not, but they're certainly going to tax your material costs and they're going to be involved from the beginning. Sure, but that's not the same That's not the same as trying to do something unconventional under the auspices of a really bureaucratic system that watches you very tightly, right? This is like the idea of the frontier. Why was the frontier such a magical and vaunted place it was because it was far enough away from the pencil pushing bureaucrats that wanted a piece where there's some basic set of rules where it's like you have to obey them but the law is far enough away that you can kind of do whatever you want and so you can't do that you can't do that in venus florida the law is too close 
I think it's closer than you think almost everywhere. It reminds me of the, Raj, is the Rajanishis. Is the that, Rajanishis, yeah. Yeah. We're like, oh, we'll go to the middle of the desert in Oregon. Nobody's going to be there to really care about us. It's like there's people everywhere, and they're pretty well organized, and they don't really care for people coming in. I mean, I doubt that the desert in South America is different than the desert in Eastern Oregon. It's not that different. <sighs> Yeah, that's probably true. And so that's, I mean, inherently, that was also a problem with the frontier, right? You're going to go out west and you're going to homestead. And it's like, well, the natives really don't want you there. And so the minute that you show up, you're immediately in conflict because you, you're the invading force that's stealing what is the birthright of the people that have been on this land for generations. Like this is really interesting from Fidarko's book about the walk in the park. One of the things that they found as they were walking through the canyon is all of these ancient Pueblo sites. There's, there was civilization in the canyon. There was people living in villages, making pottery, growing things. There was, uh, when he, he describes the first passage through the canyon by Powell, they were starving because they lost one of their boats. They had a food boat and through one of the rapids, uh, when they were going through one of the rapids, it capsized and they lost all their food and so they were starving. And just as they thought that they were going to starve to death, they ended up passing a bend in the river and there was a garden there. So when in, in the 1800s, I guess, when Paolo was going through, there was still somebody that was living down there and was established enough that they had a garden. So they stole a bunch of vegetables and survived until they had made it out of the canyon, basically. Yeah, so I, I guess the admonishment here to the Prometheus people would be you better integrate smoothly and involve those people from the very very start in in getting involved because I honestly think that those are going to be the people who are participating largely at their in the early stages right whether confrontationally participating or integratively participating they're there they care a lot and they might seem like an insignificant force to you, but... Doesn't They're only an insignificant like... force until you poke the bear, so to speak. That's right. And they can rally support, too, right? If if they end up... You know, they, there is a wider nation-state at play wherever you go. And if those locals can get that wider nation-state, just like, you know... Just like... I don't know if this happened with the Rajanishis, but, you know, Ruby Ridge, Waco, right? You get the, you get the feds involved because you don't really like these weirdos who are hanging out in your town all of a sudden i think the feds didn't get involved with the rajanishis until they started poisoning people yeah well <laughs> waco was a little different ruby ridge was a little different right huge shock and awe show of force and i think the feds have walked back on doing that kind of thing because it would turn out to be a big pr disaster but the point remains that if you don't like some people in your town you can definitely militarize the situation pretty quickly. And so the idea here is that you cannot have a, platon a platonic utopian project because there is no situation where you can plop down and be free of the strictures of the system in which you're building the project. We unfortunately live in a vast global world and even the resources that you need <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even the resources that you need to build the first iteration of this requires that you're deeply tied into these systems of commerce and capitalism. And so the the reason to still pursue it is because you might be able to come up with a system that people actually like much more than the existing one. And so they'll... And inspire multiples of it, right? Yes, exactly. And so, okay, projects like this are inherently doomed to fail because... You cannot have a platonic form of utopia because there's always evil in the world and actors that wish to exploit you. But if you structure your governance carefully enough, you might be able to ballast yourself against those forces well enough for long enough that you're able to establish a project that survives for multiple generations and is able to do a lot of good in the world, despite the fact that it will eventually fail because it's captured by all of the same forces. But Not all utopias are created equal. 
Yeah. Right? I mean, not all worker ownership is like Ishmus is a great example. They had a more intelligent design for their constitution, straight up, than something like the cab company who's spending eight hours a week with the entire company in a barn trying to make decisions together. Right. So there's there I don't think that every utopia is bound to fail is specific enough of a statement. Hmm. Yeah, all institutions crumble eventually, but I think that you can set up a system in such a way that it can continually renew itself and that it's just greased better, right? In the case of Ishmus manufacturing, it's just a better greased institution. Well, you can argue that it's richer, and that's what helps it. I see it as an organizational thing. When I walked into either one of those places and saw the degree of engineering that went into the constitution of Ishmus, it just seemed like they thought of all the contingencies a lot deeper than the cab company. You're right. They're also engineers. They're intellectuals to begin with. They make more money. They have bigger capital projects, but they also have bigger capital expenses. But they the, have lots of different types of... That's one of the most beautiful things about that project, by the way, is there's different types of people all working together. That's something you need for a city. That's what I'm saying with these trash pickers. A huge part of... I keep saying trash picking, but that's a huge part of his industrial process is that it's this circular material economy. A huge part of it is recycling and, and reclamation and just hard physical labor, honestly. People manning these factories and machinery and repairing the train lines... And Ishmus did an incredible job of integrating the machinists, the assembly line people, and the engineers under one roof in a, such a way that they can all participate equally in the government through periodic elections. Very unique. I think that that has a lot to do with the business that they chose. Right? Because a cab company in the era of Uber and Lyft is almost a f failed entity by default. Like, even if you have the most capitalist cutthroat cab company, it's still collapsing under the weight of ride-sharing. That cab company might not be alive anymore, as far as yeah, I know. Yeah, we should I mean, it w they formed before the Uber-Lyft revolution. They did, and we saw them after the Uber-Lyft revolution. They had been around for right a long around time. The, right around the peak of it, right, right when it really popped off, right? Yeah, and so we were watching them just struggle. Suffer. Yeah, it was really, really hard for them. And so it's like hard to disengage those events where I'm like, well, if Ishmus was in a business where the entire field was dying, that might have been a very different experience than if they were, than seeing them working on something that is at the heart of modern civilization, which is building assembly line robots. I'm like, that's, that's what everybody needs. We, we live in a world that is a material world at its basis. And so you see a company that's doing really well and has this governance. And I'm like, those two things must be related to one another because success begets more success. And when you have a good business that you've settled on, it's probably easier to work through all of these things than if everybody's really freaked out because we're about to die. So what's at the heart of your statement that the utopias are impossible, but they're worth trying? So I tie it to... It sounds very anarchist. Interesting, how so? Uh, I feel like the anarchist critique, in some sense, from Farabend and to some extent Graeber, is this outsider perspective that, you know, anything you try sucks. And so we should just explore all sorts of options and not stick to one system anyways. Yeah, I'm like, I think that they're inherently doomed to fail. And so the goal is to see if you can iterate well enough to come up with something that manages to avoid that trap for as long as humanly possible. Because I don't think that any system is immune to eventual capture run across enough generations. Mutations accumulate. There's something about the way that governance works where you build up these bureaucracies and then like money gets folded into it and when you're moving these vast sums of money and you decide to try to make money off of your money there's this weird squaring thing that just explodes and 
creates massive problems. And so you could say that, like, okay, well, we won't have a stock market or something. But then you run into the problem of the fact that everybody else has a stock market. And you need to be able to make sure that your wealth is not being depreciated on the world scale so you can still participate equally. And so it just becomes... We have capital expenses, too. It's a huge problem, right, with these worker ownership businesses. Is you have something really expensive, like, I don't know, a coffee a mill cabs. or whatever it is. A yeah. fleet of cabs, right? you got to put down a lot of money. And so that requires investors. And then it's like, all right, we owe these people something. Exactly. And so it's like, okay. But maybe you can come up with something that works a little bit better. And so it's worth still trying because we don't know what we don't know. And just because we haven't found a system that works better yet doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And so you can operate with both of these ideas in your mind that like most of these versions are probably doomed to fail. And yet we should still pursue them because they might have a longer time horizon than we realize. And that'll be good because for that period of time that they're existing, we'll decrease suffering in the world and... That's kind of the goal. So two things. One, having a vision of the ideal, I think, is extremely useful in terms of orienting yourself towards a future that's better than one that you're the present that you're in. Two, it seems to me that the best thing you could do when designing any organization, institution, or utopian metropolis is to forge some level of flexibility into the ingredients in the first place, into the constitution, to make sure that it has the ability to renew itself constantly. And I think that's been the fundamental feature of success with the United States to this point, where it's becoming so administratively bloated that it's, like Elon says, it's getting to be illegal to do almost anything at this point. Or at least the legal costs associated, the risks and liabilities outweigh the benefits that you get from bringing some new technology online. And there might be an era of de-bureaucratization, right? Because, I mean, somebody could come in and just say, okay, we're going to strip this down to the studs, see what breaks, and then try to fix it. That's kind of what he did with Twitter, where he fired a huge number of people, saw that, okay, these are the things that break, these are the things that don't break, and we can build a, a more streamlined, more effective team now that we know what's actually essential. It could just result from natural population decline, too, as densities increase and people stop having kids in these cities. You just have less people, you don't need them, you can't justify the administration, you can't justify one government person for one citizen at some point. You're just like, it just becomes grotesque and expensive yeah so it's like maybe this is just a feature of peak population right and so as the pop like you said as the population decreases naturally then these problems kind of solve themselves because bureaucracy is expensive and when you have lots of people you can spend money on something that is not necessary and when you have lots of money you can spend it on something that's not necessary but the minute that you have fewer workers, then you have to start asking the question of like, okay, well, what's actually essential? And so maybe it'll solve itself, right? That I'm kind of also in the, of the opinion that lots of things tend to solve themselves. It's like a regression to the mean in some way for social structures. So I can see a hinge here, if you don't mind mm. creaking a little bit. All right. Does it need because oil? Because I believe that when we started this project, which was originally called Demystifying Science, now the Demystify Sci podcast and everything associated with it, we had a very utopian ideal for what science should be mm. or was meant to be. And so the funny word about the funny thing about the word mysticism, demystify. Mysticism is often held up as the punching bag for rationalism. It's the antithesis. For sure. And the dream was, for us originally, I'll, I'll just speak for myself, the dream was that science should be this purely mechanical illustration of a process in nature such that it can be understood from point A to point B with nothing missing in between. And as we've started to study things beyond the atom, by the way, I think that's a fantastic approach for the atom, but as we've moved beyond the world of atoms, and we've moved into trying to understand how the world works and the stories that keep this place running 
operate, we've found that there's something else happening behind the scenes that doesn't fit to this utopian plan. And we haven't really had a contingency for it, which is why people are always cracking jokes about how we should call the podcast Remystifying Science, because we're talking to people about the nature of consciousness, panpsychism, parapsychology, whatever else. Exactly. And so it's an interesting hinge here because in some sense, science is this utopian ideal that you will be able to explain everything in terms of mechanics. And yet, anybody's ordinary everyday experience would point them to the realization that there's more happening in the world than atoms. And that's a bit of a nightmare for science, but science seems to be opening up to the hope that it can tackle things in the mystical realm. That's a really interesting feature of the modern era. And I think that the psychedelic revolution has played into that because you have scientists going out, like Christoph Koch, who are going out and having these mystical experiences. Mystical experiences are essentially on demand for the first time. And that's why I think that this piece that we read by William James is fascinating. And the most interesting part of this book for me... Varieties of religious experience, right? Yeah, I guess it's a series of lectures. The most interesting chapter or lecture from this for me was the one about mysticism, not because mysticism hasn't been discussed at length in the popular world today of podcasts and so forth, but they had no conception of the psychedelic experience, or he at least doesn't reference it once. And you will find it almost impossible to hear people discussing mysticism in the present day without bringing psychedelics into it. So I'm kind of, there's two things I'm juggling here as usual. One of them is that science is practiced by scientists who are now having on-demand mystical experiences. And like Christoph Koch, 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 like Christoph Koch, they're realizing I've been working really hard on this atomistic version of a computer for the mind that's able to create consciousness. Then I all of a sudden have an experience that is so real to me. It's beyond any other reality that I've experienced. It's more compelling than any of my theories or anything I've ever read or anything I know about the atomistic world of the brain. And it cannot be accounted for. And it's real. And I know it's real. And I can't explain it to you. And that's the pinnacle of a mystical experience. So mystical experiences are on demand today. Or, you know, you can go and get one. Go like have yourself a, lever, a mystical yeah. experience. You can do it, right? Anybody can do it. Now, when well, to I'm reading... some degree, because it's really interesting, because something that surprised me about Coke was that he was like, I had this mystical experience on psychedelics once, mm -hmm. and I've tried to do it again, and I can't do it. That's true. That's and so true. there is something about set and setting and moment and everything else that doesn't necessarily mean that if you pull all the right levers and take all the right chemicals that you will have what amounts to being a mystical experience, which is kind of interesting. That's true, but I think that it, I, more often than not, with people who have begun experimenting with psychedelics, they are able to crack into some mystical realm. It seems to be more often the case than not. If you read the literature on DMT, it's very high it's way more than half of people have some sort of transcendent mystical experience but but so to tie this to the earlier utopian conversation i think that the there's a there's a parallel here which gives an interesting frame for discussion which is that a utopian project is very beautiful and purposeful and offers to bring a lot of good into the world but is impossible to achieve because evil spontaneously arises and people will try to take over the project. It's and useful to outsiders, yeah. Exactly. And so the, the parallel here is that a mechanistic science that actually seeks to explain the world of atoms and draw everything out and show the direct causal relationships that starts from atoms and ends in galaxies and ends in the universe is really beautiful and really deeply meaningful to pursue it's idealistic yeah and yet Ideal. it is an impossible project and 
I think that what we want to do with this conversation is we want to try to diagnose why exactly it's an impossible project. Because for the utopian stuff, I can understand why it's an impossible project. I've talked to enough people about it. I seem to have a decent grasp. But with the demystifying science, I'm like, we have transitioned away from that. But I don't think that we've ever really sat down and, and diagnosed why we realized that it was a failed attempt. Or why inherently it is a project that cannot work which is why William James's work about the varieties of religious experiences is so interesting and useful because it seems to strike at the heart of a recurring event that arises over and over again. It's like this mutation. Like ah, he he says something right at the beginning. So the book is really funny because the first lecture he spends uh just justifying what he means by religion. And it really strikes me as uh, a reflection of the times where he's just trying desperately to get people to stop coming at him. Where he's like, look, I know that you have a picture of what religious experience means. Um, don't get mad at me. I'm doing my best. I'm defining in these really strict ways. And he just digresses over and over again to justify why his treatment of religious experiences is valid. And then by the time that he gets to the third lecture, it's called... It's actually a very general definition set, right? He's like, I'm not talking about any particular church. I'm not even going to talk about churches. I don't care about theology. I don't, I'm not bringing that in at all. I just mean that one's personal experience with the transcendent, essentially, is their religion. Yeah, exactly. Their um, relation, one's relationship to a higher power. That's it. Yeah, um, I don't have the quote for like where he actually says that, but he says something really interesting in the opening of the third lecture, which is the uh, dealing with the unseen. And I think that it's a really useful point to make here, where he says right at the opening, were one asked to characterize the life of religion in the broadest and most general terms possible, one might say that it consists of the belief that there is an unseen order and that our supreme good lies in harmoniously adjusting ourselves thereto. And he's basically trying to say that... God, it's so similar to the project of science. Yeah, like you, you there is a world that you can't see, but you feel it. And since you can't see it, your mind fills in the blanks. And so because there will always be something that we can't see, we are always subject to this emergence of mysticism because the minute that something is invisible, all bets are off. Yeah, I'm, I mean, there's two ways that I can react to the mystifying of science. One is to say that perhaps science can understand these mystical experiences the other is to say that we should stop expecting science to understand these mystical experiences, and that we should stop expecting science to be the end-all, be-all approach to the unseen. I can see either side of that. I can still see the beauty of the utopian scientific project that, you know, we have mechanics, we can explain everything with mechanics. That would be fantastic. How nice. And I think there's a lot of promise in that, but that project might have a limitation. It might not be able to explain everything. And if we could be okay with the fact that science wasn't the end-all, be-all metaphysical approach to understanding the world we live in, that might be fine. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that the modern world has that same level of humility for what the project of science is capable of. We want science to explain everything down to a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. Yeah, and it's like on one hand, wouldn't that be cool? It would be cool. It would be great. <laughs> I but, would love somebody to explain anything and everything to me. Right. Or have a system of doing so. But I think that this is what it comes down to, is that there's things that are inaccessible to us and will forever be inaccessible to us. And so we that line of what is inaccessible shifts constantly. We have people looking at subatomic particles mashing together electrons and getting things out of them that they're like, oh, well, now we see something new. And so now because we can see it, 
and we can try to explain it, and they come up with mathematical equations that describe the path and the trajectories and start to put all these just-so stories onto what that means. And yet, everybody who's into particle physics recognizes that there's a detector limit, and you have to build progressively higher and higher energy particle colliders in order to be able to get to the next level. And it's like, at what point do we realize that that's kind of an atrocious approach to trying to understand nature? Because it's like, you're never going to get to some basement bottom where you're like, okay, well, there's nothing below this. That just doesn't seem plausible or realistic. And so the attempt to eradicate the unseen seems absurd. And so the goal then is to figure out how to draw the line of the unseen that you can live with so that something mystical and meaningful can live there that kind of animates the entire project, right? Yeah. And so James does a really interesting treatment of mysticism because it's not this on-demand experience for him. It's something that just kind of happens to people throughout their lives, which is so different than the way that we think about mysticism today. I mean, almost definitionally, mysticism is that which can't be brought back to the world. Hmm. He defines mysticism in a listicle, unfortunately. <laughs> but it has two main characteristics. One is ineffability, and the other is noetic quality. The ineffability is what I'm talking about, where you can't express what just happened. Uh, let me just quote him. The handiest of marks by which I classify a state of mind as mystical is negative. The subject of it immediately says that it defies expression, that no adequate report of its contents can be given in words. It follows from this that its quality must be directly experienced. It cannot be imparted or transferred to others. In this peculiarity, mystical states are more like states of feeling than like states of intellect. No one can make clear to another who has never had a certain feeling in what the quality of worth of it consists. One must have musical ears to know the value of a symphony. One must have been in love oneself to understand a lover's state of mind. And then the second quality, noetic qualities, is very different because it's actually about having a no some sense of knowledge conveyed upon you by the experience. So it's in some sense in direct conflict with ineffability. Although so similar to states of feeling, mystical states seem to those who experience them to be also states of knowledge. They are states of insight into depths of truth unplumbed by the discursive intellect. They are illuminations, revelations, full of significance and importance, all inarticulate, though they remain. And as a rule, they carry with them a curious sense of authority for after time. So you come back from this mystical experience, you know you just had your consciousness updated, you can't say why. And that's what makes it the biggest problem for consciousness, or sorry, for science, and for trying to understand things in an atomistic sense, because it's indeterminate by definition. Okay, I have this revelation that we don't understand everything, but that's all I can say about it. I love talking to people about their psychedelic experiences because of how impossible it is for them to make me understand what it was like. Yeah, I mean, even the best writer can't explain the thing because there's no... You can say ego death or whatever, but what does that actually mean to experience ego death? What does it feel like? It can only be transmitted, like he says from one person who's experienced it to another person who's experienced it. And so I guess the, the, the idea of creating a mechanistic study of consciousness where we're going to be able to figure out what bits and pieces are necessary to string together in a specific way where you can have a synthesized conscious experience would seem to be trying to get past that impossible to cross threshold right because it's like if you can build something conscious then you've mechanistically 
investigated what this whole thing is, and presumably you'll be able to learn something about the mathematical relationships between the underlying foundational structures that tells you about what it is that it's tuning into, right? Like, if you understand the structure of an antenna, you can understand something about the way that electromagnetic radiation works because you think about what the atoms in the antenna are doing, what they're actually paying attention to, what they're reacting to, and then you can start to reconstruct, okay, well, what is the transmitter doing? And then you have a working model of here's the transmitter, here's the receiver, here's what the signal is that passes between them. Now we have a mechanistic point-to-point -point explanation for what created the signal, how the signal was transmitted, and how the signal is received, done, mechanism achieved, science accomplished. And so the hope is that, okay, well, if we can build a machine that can do that for consciousness, and we're able to actually create a test that accurately measures whether or not the thing is having a conscious experience, well, then we'll have understood something about what it is that consciousness is and what this whole unseen perspectival thing is. The problem is consciousness is a mystical experience to some extent. Like, you can never know if something is conscious or not. Only it can know. Right? I mean, these chats have passed the Turing test a long time ago. Right? But nobody really thinks they're conscious yet. But why not? Well, Koch would say because the structures upon which they're built are insufficiently complex to produce this kind of chaotic causal network that moves You can postulate that, but there's no right, way of, of right. testing it. I mean, have we just proved the philosophical zombie? Uh, that experiment, right? Because, I mean, that's what it is. But it, that, that's basically what it's structured around. If you have something that acts and looks and speaks in a way that appears conscious, can you tell that it doesn't have any internal experience? And it seems to suggest that you're saying absolutely not. Like, it, it, only it can know. And so you ask it, are you conscious? And it says yes or no, and you have to trust it, and that's kind of the end of it. But the idea is that if you could actually have a working theory for what consciousness is, that you could make that evaluation accurately. Because you'd be able to say that, well, like, look, the co consciousness is built out of these pieces, and this thing doesn't have these pieces, therefore it is or it isn't conscious. You know, I feel like artists and philosophers have been studying consciousness since time immemorial. I think artists more like wielding consciousness than studying it. Philosophers studying it. You don't think that Shakespeare's studying consciousness when he sets up these dramas? and sees the inevitable consequences of the human condition playing out in each person. I think he's wielding it, right? Because he's trying to achieve an emotional response. And I think that it's more feeling than, than experimental study. I don't think that Shakespeare necessarily... I mean, well, I don't know. Maybe he has like a really solid philosophical framework for the way that a story should be structured. I have no idea. I just feel like it's easy to look at a piece of artwork as a study of some some quality of existence. Sure. Okay, I'll give you that. What's the what's the overlying? It's interesting to me just that scientists have showed up now mm -hmm. and they want to be part of that. Mm. Because again, I I've I'm very unsure that science is cut out to this project. Can you, you know, yes, you can, if, and so much as science is a systematic way of study, people say that all the time, okay, but so is art or anything else is also a systematic mode of study, where I'm sure Leonardo da Vinci is trying and doing all sorts of experiments to figure out the best way for him to represent any particular vision that he has in his mind. Like, there's plenty of experimentation and all of that. It's very difficult to define science that way. But if science is just mechanistic explanations for phenomena, I don't know that it's cut out to something like studying the world or, conscious, you know, the world of people and ideas. Consciousness, right? I mean, the antenna thing is as close as they can get, but it's still sorely lacking because it imagines that everybody is just this, these 
at atomic antenna that are picking up on some nebulous field of consciousness. But the reality is, what is that field of consciousness? Well, it's all of our experiences. It's the world we interact with. It's the media we consume. It's the art. It's the love. It's it's our lives. That's the broth. It's not a physical substance that you're sticking this antenna into. It's not even this nice, neat atomic relay, as in the case of light. Well, it's, it's bound technologically. Right. I mean, ultimately, the goal of the scientific project to study consciousness, I think, has been folded into the technological aim of producing a conscious agent. For what reasons, I don't totally understand. Like, it seems, uh, it kind of reminds me of the ant that's uh, infected with the zombie fungus and it climbs to the top of the blade of grass in order to release the spores. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I just, I'm like, why are you building this? And nobody really has an answer. It's an interesting engineering puzzle. Like, yep. the people who work on it are really fascinated by puzzles. Mm -hmm. Like, all of the hard-bit nerds that I've ever known were always way into the kinds of computer games like Myst and Woodruff and the Schnibble or the Grim Fandango. Like, I don't think that you know any of these. But they're basically these, uh, oh, the Monkey Island games, too, where you're basically a character in a world that has a non-linear narrative and you have to go around and you have to gather clues and you have to piece together how to solve puzzles. And then once you've figured out how to solve the puzzle, another set of puzzles opens. And like, these are the people that are now working on how do you create a conscious machine? They're just puzzlers. And so it's this always, is the biggest puzzle. It's always accompanied by the promise that the technology will alleviate our suffering and our toil as well, right? There's this, I think there's a dream of replacing, of making some sort of humane version of slavery cool again. Oh, yeah. Right? It's like, oh, but it never works out that way. The Jetsons world never plays out. As soon as you give the housewife lots of tools for her kitchen to save time, now she's going to be busy with an infinite number of other chores that couldn't have been attended to beforehand. To some degree, I do think that like the ennui of the 1950s for the modern housewife did have a lot to do with the fact that the labor-saving devices made it so that there was just a lot of empty time, right? If you don't have to pick up all of your rugs and carry them outside and beat them with a stick and you can just run the sweeper and you're not hand-washing all of the laundry, you... You have a you put it in the machine. You press the button. You're like, God, what now? And that is a really horrifying thing that lends itself to all kinds of philosophical contortions. True, true. But I think that a bigger version of that is playing out in the modern era. I think we look at our own lives as we adopt new technologies to streamline our workflow. It's not like we work less. We just add more projects to our billet. I, but I think that that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as no. the projects that you add are meaningful, right? So it's like if the labor-saving device allows you to then do something else that you find more meaningful because you spend less time uh, clicking buttons on YouTube in order to make sure that the upload is perfectly packaged and you're able to spend that time uh, building a planter or replacing the siding on your house or working on music or reading a book. Like This is the attraction of AI, is that yes. it will save you from the tedium of your ordinary life so that you can pursue more meaningful tasks. And it might be true. Yeah. It also might be that we're infected with a fungus that's going to completely replace us. Well, I don't necessarily think that it's going to completely replace us. It's just... We appear to be ca caught in this program to produce a novel portal into consciousness. Like it seems like the entire the entire computing process, which emerges out of the scientific project of the mid century to like build an atom bomb, I think, is the desire to create machines that can think because people are fallible. And if you can have a machine that can think, it won't be fallible in the same way that people are. And you'll be able to bring about some kind of quasi-utopian system where the machine is infallible and trustworthy and will never lead you astray. This is kind of, game theory comes out of this too, 
right? Where you're able to find optimal outcomes for every single situation where you satisfy your own desires. And so you build a machine that is able to run the most complex game humanly possible so that you always come out on top. The this is an age-old dream because all the way back to the 60s as far as I can tell. Sure. And so building a super intelligence that can do that for you would mean that you would remain forever on top because as long as you're the only one that has the super intelligence, everybody else is just using the mental equivalent of Stone Age tools. They're just like monkeys bashing oysters with rocks. Like you're always going to do really well and they won't. The weird thing is, is that it's... It's an alienating technological process, like you say, where as we build these machines, they seem to be like breaking something inside of us as we build them. And we're depending more and more on them in a way that alienates us from the inherent magic and mysticism of life. What, can you say more about what's breaking? Well, I saw, I came across something really interesting, which is that, um, None of the tech executives uh, appear to have allowed their kids to grow up with the tech that they were building. Oh, really? Yeah, like they would all send them to these technology-free schools that were like these schools where all the tech executives, like this Waldorf school in the Bay Area. And I haven't, I haven't dug too deeply into it, but it makes sense that if the people that are building this machine are like, this is not going to be good for us, and I don't want my kids exposed to it, if they're defecting on the public school system and sending their children somewhere else so that they can grow up without the pressure of this technology on them, while everybody else embraces the technology, uses it, and is marked forever by it. I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine us moving deeper and deeper into the machine and not losing something in the process. Like I read even William James and it's such a, it's such a, like old books always give me this feeling of the depth of intellectual discourse and the depth of thought. Like William James didn't have anything to get distracted on. He was just thinking and reading and writing all of the time. And now everybody's broken up into all of these little bureaucratic things that they have to take care of, all of the emails that they have to send, the, the correspondences that they maintain, the, the buttons and the levers they have to pull. And it's, it draws us away from being able to contemplate the mystical. It draws us away from being able to contemplate the divine experience of being alive. And our scientific project is like, no, we can explain this materialistically. And so uh, go have your experience on demand. Uh, we'll continue to work on what the fun foundational uh, structural correlates of this experience are. We'll build machines that can do our thinking for us, and they will bring about a utopia where the evils of the world are properly managed and never again pose a problem, and we'll live happily ever after. And it's like... I think that the, the trad life movement of the return to the land movement, everything else, is this primal scream of saying no there's something really viscerally beautiful about being attached to the land and to the earth that is lost when we live in this machine consciousness universe yeah this this reminds me of the previous lecture before the mysticism lecture where he's talking about sainthood hmm. and there's a quote that i really wanted to read here <clears throat> where he, he essentially explores the idea that the promise of the modern technological world, although it wasn't the modern technological world at the time, there was... It's like starting, the tendrils were there, right? But Automation, machines, labor-saving devices. He recognized something about America in particular, which was this idea that, you know, in the best case scenario, it's the American dream. You can pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and make something of yourself. But he seems to be really suspicious of the idea that that is really what constitutes making something of yourself. And he seems to think that it's encoded in the attitude of pity that we have towards people of poverty. Mm -hmm. He actually says, it is certain that the prevalent fear of poverty among the educated classes is the worst moral disease from 
which our civilization suffers. <clears throat> the fear of poverty is the moral disease? Yeah, because universally, well, not universally, but most of the saints that he goes through and the saint-like people and the saint-like qualities who are these people who are devoted towards charity at all costs are in no way concerned with their material state to the point of you know, being on the street, suffering, barefoot, healers, etc., and yet they seem to be the people that are most satisfied with their existence. And he's like, I think that there's something really condescending about being of the educated class and looking at poor people and saying, well, we should help them get out of their situation. Because he's like, look, a lot of poor people, he doesn't say this explicitly, but I think this is what he's pointing to. A lot of people that live in some degree of poverty, yes, it's miserable to be in poverty, no doubt. But they chose that way of life because they want nothing to do with the world of wealth acquisition and management and material obsession and the drama and falseness and et cetera. Networking that accompanies that. and everything Yeah, else. they're like, that's, a, that's, I would much rather be starving or malnourished or scraping by, toiling even, than live a life of that sort of plastic tree fakeness that is undoubtedly unsatisfying right okay so this is where the duality comes in again because you i don't think that you can have a functional world of all mystics i think that that basically everybody starves to death the mystic doesn't necessarily farm the mystic doesn't build roads the mystic doesn't maintain the telephone lines right like there's a there's a certain uh, spiritual embodiment that the mystic is, has access to that's very beautiful and meaningful to the world. Like we've talked about this before where it's like you can't have a society of all shamans and people have called us out in the comments where they're like everybody had these experiences in these traditional societies where they were regularly consuming psychedelics and I'm like that's probably true but it's also true that those same people were going out and they were doing all of the necessary work of the society as informed by the mystical experiences. Like, they, they entered into a place of mystical experience. They had this impossible to convey experience. They carried something away from it, and then they went off and they did whatever their tribal role was, imbued with the knowledge that they were participating in something massive and meaningful. Yeah, often coming of age ceremonies and so forth. Well, that's the thing. The, the, I'm thinking of a specific comment where they're like, it wasn't just coming of age ceremonies. It was regular ceremonial uses over the course of an entire life. Like the coming of age ceremony was a massive piece. I just, in my exploration of past uh, psychedelic usage or mystical experiences, it seems like it's a, a very rare experience. Like someone might do a pilgrimage. Somebody might have this coming of age, but it's not something that people are doing regularly like today. Perhaps. And so like, certainly people aren't just, you know, having these experiences once a week or every every day. Right. And so it's like, okay, the, 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 the guy who left the comment could be totally wrong, but I'm like, I think that there's something to be said about the, the idea that there are mystics that are the ones that are the facilitators of the experience. And uh, go ahead. Those are the people that I'm worried about and I think pose a danger to science. And that's, Whoa. yeah. Okay. But can we, can, I want to get there. Okay. I do want to get there because I do think that the mystic is different than mystical experience because mystical experience is particularly in James's day was something prosaic that everybody was having happen regularly in there. Not everybody fairly, regularly. Yeah. He includes deja vu as a hmm. mystical experience. I mean, I wanted to read you some of these case reports because they're so, so different than what we would think of as mystical today. And this was only a hundred years ago. Yeah, do you want right. to? Right, so okay, cool. the simplest rudiment of mystical experience would seem to be that deepened sense of the significance of a maxim or formula which occasionally sleeps, sweeps over one. Quote, I've heard that said all my life, but I never realized its full meaning until now. There's a mystical experience. When a fellow monk, said Luther, one day repeated the words of the creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I saw the scripture in an entirely new light, and straight away I felt as if I were born anew. It was as if I had found a door of paradise thrown wide open. 
This sense of deeper significance is not confined to rational propositions. Single words and conjunctions of words, effects of light on land and sea, odors and musical sounds all bring it when the mind is tuned all right. Tuned aright. Most of us can remember the strangely moving power of passages in certain poems read when we were young, irrational doorways as they were, though which the mystery of fact, the wilderness and the pang of life stole into our hearts and thrilled them. The words have now perhaps become mere polished surfaces for us, but lyric poetry and music are alive and significant only in proportion as they fetch these vague vistas of life continuous with our own, beckoning and inviting, yet ever eluding our pursuit. We are alive or dead to the internal inner message of the acts. Sorry, this, this writing is just a mouthful. We are alive or dead to the eternal inner message of the arts according as we have kept or lost this mystical susceptibility. And I, I did, there are a couple of examples that, that I wanted to, to read too of just, he, he farms out from various sources. I think these are psychologists for the most part who are getting these case reports from people. And, and some of them are just so utterly normal. One reads, I have never had any revelations through anesthetics, but a kind of waking trance. This, for lack of a better word, I have frequently had quite up from boyhood when I was all alone. This has come upon me through repeating my own name to myself silently, till all at once, as if it were out of the intensity of the consciousness of individuality, individuality itself seemed to dissolve and fade away into boundless being. And this is not a confused state, but the clearest, the surest of the surest, utterly beyond words, where death was an almost laughable impossibility, the loss of personality, seeming no extinction, but the only true life. I am ashamed of my feeble description. Have I not said the state is utterly beyond words? Uh, let me find another one. When I was walking, when I walk the fields, I'm pressed now and then with an innate feeling that everything I see has a meaning, if I could but understand it. And this feeling of being surrounded with truths which I cannot grasp amounts to indescribable awe sometimes. Have you not felt that your real soul was imperceptible to your mental vision, except in a few hallowed moments? Another person writes, Suddenly, at church or in company, or when I was reading, and always, I think, when my muscles were at rest, I felt the approach of the mood. Irresistibility. Irresistibly, it took possession of my mind and will, lasted what seemed an eternity, and disappeared in a series of rapid sensations which resembled the awakening from anesthetic influence. One reason why I disliked this kind of trance was that I could not describe it to myself. I cannot even now find words to render it intelligible. It consisted in a gradual but swiftly progressive obliteration of space, time, sensation, and the multitudinous factors of experience which seem to quantify what we are pleased to call our self, capital self. In proportion, as these conditions of ordinary consciousness were subtracted, the sense of an underlying or essential consciousness acquired intensity. At last, nothing remained but a pure, absolute, abstract self. The universe became without form and void of content, but self persisted, formidable in its vivid keenness, feeling the most poignant doubt about reality, ready, as it seemed, to find existence break as breaks a bubble round about it. And what then? The apprehension of a coming dissolution, the grim conviction that this state was the last state of the conscious self, the sense that I had followed the last thread of being to the verge of the abyss, and I had arrived at demonstration of eternal maya or illusion, stirred or seemed to stir up in me again. The return to ordinary conditions of sentient existence began by my first recovering the power of touch, and then by the gradual, the rapid influx of familiar impressions and diurnal interests. At last I felt myself once more a human being, and though the riddle of what is meant by life remained unsolved, I was thankful for this return from the abyss, this deliverance from so awful an initiation into the mysteries of skepticism. I mean, he goes on and on and on, and these are just people who are like having these, they're going for walks in the countryside, you know, they're lying in bed, they're, they're just so normal. These are not people who are going to the jungles of the Amazon to trip on ayahuasca. 
These do are, you not have these experiences? I totally do. And okay. I did when I was a kid yeah. too. And I think that's his point is that this is a natural part of existence for everyone to some extent. Spacing out and having this like tingly sensation come over you where you're just, maybe you're just watching the light on a leaf or something. Like you don't have to be on drugs to have this happen to you. And there's something about the modern discussion which seems to always revolve around psychedelics as the modality for having these experiences, I think has obscured its centrality to our existence. It seems baked into the cake that we have these quite regular epiphanies about the cosmic interconnectedness of the universe and are completely overwhelmed by the beauty of the mundane. It's so interesting to me that he, one of the experiences that he describes is this feeling of going out into nature and having this overwhelming sense of connection and meaning in the way that it all fits together in the way that it flows and the life and the death and the decay and the rebirth and all of this. Yeah. Because when I became a biologist, I thought that that was what biology studied. It was such a deeply naive hmm. thing. Like I, I, I kept going through the various scales of biology because I hoped that somewhere that would be the focus. And obviously pursuing biochemistry was probably the most like wrong-headed approach to getting close to that. But it took me a long time to realize that. But that's something that I still feel, right? It's the sense of of meaning in nature, untrammeled nature, and not a, an environment that has not been built, an environment that has built itself, where you're able to remember that you're part of something that is so much larger than you, that you have this momentary experience. Like at our patron chats, that guy Mike Hall is always talking about this. He went to Alaska and lived for a year in a cabin by himself, with, and he didn't bring any books. That's the thing that's crazy. Is he basically just went to experience He's like, you have this experience every day. Mm -hmm. He's like, you have this mystical experiences all the time. Sure, but I think that like what Hull, Hull's experience shows is that there's something really wild that happens when you seep into it for an extended period of time. And that's kind of the domain of the mystic, is the person who goes and lives in that state permanently and tries to bring back these ideas and give them to others. That's kind of the, like the saint is in some ways the person who commits themselves fully and wholly to mysticism, not necessarily with the hope of, of bringing something back, but just because they find such deep meaning in it and others find them and then learn from them and, and try to glean their insights and canonize them. And so it's well, like, the saints are doing work in the real world. I think that's what separates them largely from mm. the mystics. I'm very, very suspicious of anyone who calls themselves a mystic. Okay, let's keep a pin on that for a second. I'm really fascinated by that. Um, but I do think that the mystical, and this is actually a really good segue because I'm like, okay, I don't think that you can have a society of mystics. Because the mystics don't do work in the world. That's the hinge. I'm like, there's, there was a meme the other day that um, came across Twitter, which was like, stoner societies are these uh, tribal hut dwelling, it's just indigenous peoples. And then the alcoholic societies are the ones that build civilization. And I don't think that that's necessary. And I, I don't think that that's a clear enough gradient. Obviously, like memes are not the... I've never been to Silicon Valley before. Yeah, that's like a... But I don't think that... that I think that Silicon Valley is actually not building society. I think that Silicon Valley is building an escape from society in many ways. Society is built out of hardware, and Silicon Valley has a serious hardware problem. They're all building software. They're all building these like ephemeral tools that if the machines go down, it's nothing. Like a big enough EMF pulse comes and wipes the data centers and stuff. They've built nothing. Well, anyways, let's. Uh, yeah. But but so I think that 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 does kind of hold in in Silicon Valley because they're not really they're building ideas. They're not building things, and the the the, the division here is that the mystic is doing something that is ephemeral and inherently immaterial, and the saint is building something in the world and actually like laying hands on people and 
doing some kind of action that has reverberations in the material world. And so I worry about the popularization of mysticism because I think that it is inherently a place from which you cannot build. When I go out into nature and I have these experiences, I think it's very easy to kind of want to just dissolve into the landscape. Sometimes I just want to lie down on a patch of grass and just never get up again. And not in, not in the sense of just this like is, suicidal ideation, but just in the sense of like this is, there's a deep sense of belonging, of wanting to root into this place and just like build some like lean to and, and fish and just stay there for forever because it feels somehow more aligned with with some deep resonant nature inside of me. But I recognize that if everybody did that, civilization ends there. I don't think you have anything to worry about because mystical experiences are inherently transient. That's one of the... So he had those first two definition sets, the noetic and... I forget what the first one was. But he has two... Unintelligibility. Unintelligibility. Was it? Uh, Ineffability. But he has two more, and one of them is that they're transients. The other one is funny. He listed it as passivity, which he basically means that you don't get to choose when it happens, Mm. which is very different today, actually, I think. I mean... You're right. You're not guaranteed a mystical experience with psychedelics, but you probably have a pretty good chance of it happening under the right conditions. But in terms of the mystic versus mysticism, I think what James, his treatment of mysticism suggests that it is an integral piece of our lives for everyone, but that it's inherently a subjective experience. It's not something that's meant to be brought back. It's not something that's meant to be used to gather a crowd around you. And so we can talk about the dangers of mysticism if you're ready to. Yeah, let's do it. And particularly the dangers as they relate to science the way that I see it. Because the thing that creeps me out about mystics is that they generally try to espouse that they have the exceptional ability to bring back that noesis and dispense that wisdom in an organizing fashion upon society. And I'm very skeptical that that is the case. And so I see them as a little bit like charlatans, con men in that camp, where who knows whether they had any revelations or whatever. Maybe everybody does when they have mystical experiences throughout their daily life. But the fundamental feature of mystical experiences is that you can't bring it back. You might be able, it might change the way that you approach your relationships or things in your life, the way that you act, but you cannot convey that wisdom to anybody else. That is the fundamental feature of the mystical experience. It is not something that can be transmitted except by way of subjective experience of the mystical experience itself. Now... Bring this back to science. Okay, so I can take this to science too. The thing that creeps me out about introducing mysticism into science is that science is by definition a communication process. You have to not only have a cool idea, but you damn well better be able to explain it to your peers. Ideally, you better be able to explain it to your grandma, as far as I can tell. So if you have a mystical element in your science, which is, uh, well, this can't be explained, and that becomes integral to your, what you're calling an explanation, then you've just institutionalized broken science, as far as I can tell. And this is what's happened with a lot of the quantum physics, from what I can tell. This is what happened at the Solvay conference back 100 years ago, from what I can tell, is that people didn't know how to explain something. And instead of being like, okay, well, we should deal with this later. Let's just study some other stuff for a while, and we'll keep talking about it. They said, you know what? We can't explain this right now. And that's going to become a feature of our science from now on, that we don't explain this thing. And if we do, we talk about it in quasi-mystical terms, like wave-particle dualities. And it's just inexplicable, shut up, it is so, we're not going to worry about it. And so what I see happening when you build a physical science with mysticism at its heart is that you have the castle on sand phenomena, where... Or, or termites eating the foundation of your house situation, where it's very subject to any winds that might blow on it. And anybody can instrumentalize it and rework those foundations to lean the castle towards their own particular 
ends. So I think that in the third lecture, The Reality of the Unseen, he's speaking exactly about this. I wish during this hour to call your attention to some of the psychological peculiarities of such an ad- attitude as this, of belief in an object which we cannot see. All our attitudes, moral, practical, or emotional, as well as religious, are due to the objects of our consciousness, the things which we believe to exist, whether really or ideally, along with ourselves. Such objects may be present to our senses, or they may be present only to our thought. In either case, they elicit from us a reaction. And the reaction due to things of thought is notoriously in many cases as strong as that due to sensible processes. It may even be stronger. The more concrete objects of most, sorry, the more concrete objects of most men's religion, the deities whom they worship, are known to them only an idea. It has been vouchsafed, for example, to very few Christian believers to have had a sensible vision of their Savior, though enough appearances of this sort are on record, by way of miraculous exception, to merit our attention later. The whole force of the Christian religion, therefore, so far as belief in the divine personages, the divine personages, determined by the prevalent attitude of the believer, is in general exerted by the instrumentality of pure ideas, of which nothing in the individual's past experience directly serves as a model. But in addition to these ideas of the more concrete religious objects, religion is full of abstract objects which prove to have equal power. God's attributes as such, his holiness, his justice, his mercy, his absoluteness, his infinity, his omniscience, his triunity, the various mysteries of the redemptive process, the operation of the sacraments, etc., have proved fertile wells of inspiring meditation for Christian believers. We shall see later that the absence of definite sensible images is positively insisted on by the mystical authorities in all religions as the sin qua non of a successful erison or contemplation of the higher divine truth. This is exactly what you're talking about, where there is this sense that there's a realm that is unseen, that is full of ideas that are kind of not possible to really wrap your head around. And so they must just be taken as being there, as being part of the, of, of the tapestry and contemplated as objects of meditation. And the, the discrete elements of how they all fit together is beyond the the question of the religion that is based on the unseen and so this is what you're talking about observe the the derision and condescension and horror that physicists will have when you tell them that we hey we should probably figure out what these equations actually mean in terms of what the atom's doing i mean there's a good percentage of people who are just like disgusted by that because it's betraying the fundamental mystical assumption of the model which is that those are not that's off limits this is the beautiful mystical heart of quantum physics and you should leave it the hell alone. And I'm like, I think that that trying to pull the mysticism out of people's in interaction with science is another one of those utopian projects that is doomed to fail. Because all of us go through the world and we have these mystical experiences where we realize that there's something that lies beyond comprehension, that there's something that is so ineffable that it can only be known not explained that and it's more real than all of the things we've explained to ourselves that's the fundamental epiphany right that's what's so troubling to these neuro- like neuroscientists like Christoph too right they're like this tops everything that i've ever been able to rationalize to myself in terms of its believability and if you're somebody who understands the math to such a depth that you can see the elegance in it and you can see the wonder in it, then it becomes the same object of mystical contemplation where you experience this noetic thing when you encounter it that you turn around and you're like, well, I can't explain this to my grandma. I can't explain this to you. I just n- I feel it. And... Anybody who's like, well, okay, well, let's try to piece this apart and actually try to try to explain what it is, is a direct threat. And so I'm like, this is the God of the gaps thing, where God used to be on earth, then God was in the clouds, then God was in space, and now God is just kind of this thing that like lives in the mystical experience that everybody has with nature, and also lives in the subatomic world in many ways, where it's just this weird thing that happens that can only be 
meditated upon but not fully understood. And so where, where do you safely put the mysticism? If you know that mysticism is inherent and you know that we always have to deal with the unseen in science, that's the thing that I'm trying to figure out. Like, where does the mysticism belong? I've always said it belongs in art and music and drama. But you can't keep the scientists away from that because they want to be able to play a part in that role. And some of them aren't art. Some of them aren't artists, and they're not musicians, and they're not philosophers. Right, and that's why the city requires all of these people to be on as close to equal footing as you can manage. Like the fact that you're going to put the philosopher kings at the center of the city and everybody's going to toil in circles around it is just preposterous to me, right? I mean, I think every cog in this city keeps it running, and perhaps the ones that are the least praised are the ones that keep it running more than anybody else, right? The people driving our the food to the grocery store, you know, the... The essential workers... Well, that, that word was kind of toppled, but yeah, I mean, ideally, right? Not just big box store workers and stuff, but sure, yeah. people who keep things running. And But there's still this question of, like, everybody wants to be able to lay claim to understanding the mystical experience. Yeah. And the artist lays that claim by producing something that perhaps in the ideal form induces the mystical experience. James kind of points to that. You read a poem and it lives inside of your heart in such a way that is forever with you. That's a mystical experience. The poet has achieved that. The philosopher... Only in so much as it's able to rekindle that tingly feeling that you had when you first encountered it. Yeah, exactly. And the philosopher that explains some inner working of the soul gives you a piece of knowledge that allows you to put some frame onto the thing that you've experienced. And the scientists, too, are like, well, there is wonder and uncertainty and mystery at the heart of the universe. And if you try to take that away from people, they freak out and because they, they want to be able to have access to it. And so I have a feeling that it is as futile of a project as the utopian endeavor, and yet it is still worth pursuing. Because perhaps you can find a place where the mysticism lives more comfortably in trying to tease these things apart to say that, hey, there's a realm where mysticism belongs and it doesn't. And as long as we can plausibly come up with material mechanistic explanations, that probably isn't where we should put mysticism. And that should be the, the, the move of last resort in the sciences. And it's not that we'll ever be able to fully eradicate it because it is so inherent to us. The same way that defecting on a community project appears to be inherent in a large enough group of people, defecting on the project of science also seems to be inherent because we want to reach and touch and hold and wield that wonder. And who can blame I'm, them? I mean, it's well put. I, I still think that the best approach would be to stop trying to believe that science can explain everything. And that if we realize that science was only capable of explaining mechanistic phenomena, then perhaps we wouldn't expect so much out of it, and we wouldn't be so tolerant of these mystic fractures at the heart of our science, which I think are ultimately detrimental. They're detrimental to the way that we think, they're detrimental to our technological progress, and they're detrimental to our organization as a civilization. Because science inherently can't deal with experience. They can try. They're, they're doing their best. They're coming up with mathematical models for how to build experience from computer chips or whatever. And what does that even mean, right? Like, well, that's deal the, with experience. It's like poets and painters, everybody's been dealing with experience quite well, as far as I can tell. They're doing a great job of it. But they don't have a mechanistic ex explanation just, for it. No, and, but leave it to them, you know? Leave it to them. Well, so this is the, the scientific Like, you don't even then. know what's happening to you when you're experiencing a profound piece of art. You're having all these realizations about your life and the world, and you don't 
you're not like rationally having them. They're just appearing to you as revelations. You like you don't you go and look at a Da Vinci work, and you don't know what's happening to you. But he's designed it actually for this to happen to you. Every single stroke of that brush has been done with strict intention to manipulate your experience into this epiphany that you're having but you don't even realize it's happening. I mean, that's a great place for mysticism, as far as I can tell. And I'm sure, by the way, da Vinci's life was punctuated by incredible mystical experiences. I mean, in his biography that I read, there's all these anecdotes of him, you know, just looking completely spaced out to his peers, you know, staring at, like, the water, and then just, like, having these flights of revelation and the guy was, you know, artists in general are constantly subjecting them. And in the modern age, often that means psychedelics, right? This is the Jimi Hendrixes of the world, right? Who are, yeah, they're having these epiphanies, but the reality is they're finding a way to encode them in a form that's useful to other people. Science also encodes understanding in forms that are useful to other people. But I think that it's a much more limited project than the world wants it to be. And so I even at the end of all of this, I still think that we'd be better off if we kept science mechanical, mechanistic, and boring as hell, and left the mysticism, the consciousness, to other experts. So you're basically like, the study of consciousness should never be a scientific endeavor. Or can, or can I mean, let's leave the should. You're basically like, it, can, it, it is doomed to fail. The truths that it's capable of coming up, uh, of discovering, are not going to be as profound revelations about consciousness as those that the artists and poets and writers and musicians will be able to unveil. Because the medium by which those arts are communicated is more appropriate to the mystical revelation than science can ever be. It also, like I got, I just got done saying, I think that it weakens the foundation of science to introduce inexplicabilities as foundational principles in an explanation. Like, it's just, it's self-contradictory. And yet, I think it is impossible to fully remove from science. Because I think that we are deeply mystical beings. Because we constantly, all of us have these experiences of recognizing the momentous weight yeah, it's this really thing. important part of reality. But that's this is why, like, you asked, hey, you try to get Bob Dylan to explain what one of his songs is about. He's like, I don't know, right? It's not like he doesn't know, but he's like, I did it already in the song. Like, you get it through the song. The song did it to you already. Like, you, that's it. That's all there is to it. There's nothing else to say about it because I worked my ass off to make you have the experience that you had, and that was the point. There's nothing to say about it. There's no explanation. It's a mystical transference. And you get that. You get that from some of the better Dylan work. It's extremely hallucinatory and mystical. And you're like, I, this, like, what the hell is this song about? Like, but it doesn't matter. It's not about something the same way that a theory of light is about something. Right? It is the impression in and of itself. And and yet, when we deal with the unseen, there is always the desire to try and make to try to to try to imbue it with this mysticism, this contemplation of that which cannot be uh, put into an object form for contemplation. And so, we might be able to win this battle for physics, but then somebody will put it like evolution is another great example of this, right? Great example, right? He talks about that. James says, "Oh, that's fascinating." He talks about evolution as the new religion, right? In very careful terms. Oh, he's right? so careful. He's I very love it. careful. He's like, please, please don't at me. But yeah, and this is I've this is one of those things that it, it pisses people off in the comments. I've just never seen a single idea that pisses people off more than when you say. Isn't evol isn't the evolution just like the Holy Spirit, right? They're like, no, 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 because it's done by natural selection and there's this mechanistic thing. And it's like, yeah, but nobody can predict where things are wandering towards. They just have this, and this is why Will ends up getting into these conversations about teleology and the future and what the organism wants and how it evolves towards what it wants. And it's like, 
We're and not so even doing is, science anymore, guys. But th- this is the thing, is that if even if you have a mechanical model for light, where one atom is connected to another atom, and their harmonic resonance allows them to uh, interact with one another in a cohesive way that Just transmits light, yeah. you still end up with the question of like, okay, well, how does the atom in question decide which atom it's going to communicate with? And there you begin to have a place where at the very base of the universe, you have to start talking about wants mm-hmm. and likelihoods. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that there, there's an energetic solution to that in terms of what's easiest at the physical landscape. I just don't think that the physical landscape is capable of revealing the explanatory reality that we desire. I just don't think it is. I don't think that explaining what's happening in this room right now is best accomplished with atoms. Sure, I would agree with that. But I think that it's like if the if the project of of like if you take biology to be a science and strip away the biochemistry and strip away the you know molecular stuff then you're left with a question of what is life and why does life do what it does and i know that that's not how people talk about biology but ultimately that is the question and i think that the question of consciousness is a deeply biological one because then you're asking like okay if you strip all that stuff away i don't think that biology is a science anymore i just, I just think that you may as well deal with that question in a, a song or deal with it in a painting or deal with it in a a drama or deal with it in a movie. There's just better ways to deal with it because once you strip away the atoms, I don't think you have any science left over. I just think you have you have what science got stuck to itself along the way. Interesting. I gotta think about that one. You might be right. I don't know. This is a constant discussion and it's really interesting seeing how people recoil against the idea i think people really want science to be this like super power that we have that it has complete and total explanatory power and i think that's what you see christoph wrestling with because it it's taught to us that way it's taught to us like it's the supreme technology that humans invented in the last few hundred years it saved us from ourselves it will save us from the future because it can deal with everything we don't even need religion anymore because we got science that's not a caricature. I think that's really how people are brought into this world. And I I don't think that that's true, fundamentally. Which is why we've expanded the things that we're, we're, we're curious about, which is where we started, right? Where the podcast began as, okay, well, let's see where we can take, how we can take the mysticism out. Because I think we began as much more as rationalists in some way, where we're like the mystical... Whatever, that's for arts and stuff like that. But I think that as we've done this project, we've really come to the realization that the mystical lives alongside of science. And yes, we must demand mechanistic explanations for things, for material explanations. And yet, there's a deep dualism in the world. The same way that the utopian project that centers on good must also reckon with evil. The rationalist project that seeks to explain mechanism must also wrestle with the mystical and find some kind of compromise or terms for interacting with that where they don't leak into each other, but they are forever wrestled with. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah. I think, I think it is a deeply dualistic way of approaching reality, but I'm fine with that. It doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Yeah. Maybe I, people in the comments will tell us why dualism is stupid. Undoubtedly. <laughs> All right, um, let's go mystify some science. (laughs) Let's not. (laughs) 